maybe we'll just um, get started with a bit of um, the polls we were looking at. So just want to say thanks for coming everyone and um, it's been a few months since we met for an AMSIG session and I think it's just a really um, key time really to talk about these issues which are looking at plan B's for people, whether it's ourselves, whether it's our colleagues, staff that we might have stood down, um, and just looking at, you know, some transferable skills for ourselves and for our staff, having a chance to chat together about what everyone's thinking about, um, how are they going in their jobs right now, or are they thinking about plan B, C's, D's. Um, we've got some really great speakers today. So Rufus James, who's an ex, uh, the ex-DOS at uh, English Unlimited in Brisbane, is going to talk to us about her career change and transferable skills um, from the ELT industry. We've got uh, the wonderful Claire McGrath, who is a uh, teacher trainer and all-round legend, who's going to talk to us about uh, LinkedIn and how we can really make use of that. And our lovely Sve uh, Svetlana Lukovic is Academic Manager of Australian Catholic University and going to give some more information about courses and PD as well from um, within, within the education industry that we could recommend to our teachers to be doing if they are, if they do have a bit of free time um, and for ourselves as well. Lovely. So we'll get cracking. So we've got a lot to get through. There will be chance for, for us to have a chat as well but we'll um, maybe start with a couple of polls. Sophie, are you okay to get those out? Yep, first one's up now. Well, that's good. Yep. Wow. That's I'm great. I wonder what the it's complicated is. What does that mean? <laughs> hmm. Could Sounds be. like a relationship status, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, there's another question up there now as well. I think amplified is a nice euphemism. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Nice. Is there one more, Sophie, or is it just those two? That's it. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. Cool. Um, so I'm gonna put us into breakout rooms. Obviously, we're in a Zoom. Just for everyone to have a little chat to chat, chat to chat, chance to chat. Sorry, teaching a lot uh, about sort of where you are now. And I'm just gonna share a couple of questions with you. Um, and okay, um, I'll just say the questions, I'll put them in the chat. So basically, um, is there another field that you're thinking of moving into out of, out of Elicos? Um, and have you employed any strategies to help your staff? to make changes in their employment. So I know myself, I've had to stand quite a lot of my teachers down temporarily. Um, and um, basically what, what have we been able to do to, to help them, if anything? Okay, so I'll just put those questions in the chat and then- But to continue, um, Claire, are you all right to give us some of your profound knowledge? Do you mean feedback on what we um, talked about in the break? Oh, sure. Like, yeah, let's do a bit of feedback, actually. That's a great idea, sure. I've just popped some notes in um, 
to the chat box, but basically it was um, looking at working with domestic students in higher education, you know, not necessarily in English language background, the ones that are, you know, um, maybe an ESL background or maybe first generation tertiary education students who need academic language and skills development and confidence, et cetera. Um, corporate training, you can see working freelance with individuals in business doing presentations. Um, looking at maybe local council work or using previous backgrounds in say business management. The second question we didn't have long to talk about, but um, it was basically doing something like this with staff and um, you know, workshopping it, brainstorming, and also um, maybe um, you know, where people have been made redundant, you know, encouraging people to make use of the um, package, if you like, that goes with it sometimes, like um, talking to, um, I'm trying to think what the name of the job title was of the people I saw, but it was basically about looking at your CV, looking at um, options with LinkedIn, et cetera. And, you know, making full use of that advice, it can feel like your, your heart's taken a bit of a battering when you are made redundant or stood down. But, you know, everybody said, look, there's opportunities out there to, you know, just gives you a chance to look at different options and to think. So yeah, I'd encourage people to make use of any kind of services that you can get like that. Beautiful, thanks, Claire. Does anyone else have anything they wanna share from their breakout room? Tony, anything from your group? Uh, I was in the same group as Claire. Um, I guess I think when we're talking, we, we only started on the second question, but I think, I don't know, I can't think of particular industries, but teachers have particular skills that have got to be valued by employers. Uh, so, I, I, <laughs> um, but I'm, yeah, how you then put that into action and make them saleable in the, the job market, I don't know. Hmm. Anyone else have anything they want to share here? Um, I'll jump in. Um, one, of, one of the things our group was talking about was uh, transferable skills for directors of studies. And I think um, while, while we might sort of sometimes think we're, we're stuck in a heli cost bubble, we've actually got a huge range of, of skills um, in, in the area of management and leadership that are transferable across a whole range of um, industries. So. If, if for any of us as, as DOSs or academic managers do, do find ourselves looking at other opportunities, um, it's just a matter of marketing those, those skills that we have, um, which we might not have thought about before um, being sort of busy in the day-to-day -day sort of world of what we do. Yes, and having examples of, um, of where to start, you know, where to start looking um, and where those skills that we have could, um, can take us, like examples, because you, it, otherwise it's kind of, I feel like going a bit, we're going a bit blind at this moment. Yeah. And I, I think I'll just jump in there as well. Um, I was in Will's group as well and Nora's. Um, even just something like this um, to just hear what other people are thinking and doing and starting to study or you know things like that i'm i've already got a few seeds planted in my brain and uh we're i think we're hugely multi-skilled really it's just uh you know as tony was saying as well how do we sell those points but constant discussions with other people in the same boat i think is really really useful so thanks in advance for having this session <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a topic that could go on and on. Yeah. Um, and I think we all should yeah, really reach out and support each other during this time because we, you know, we are all in the same ship. <laughs> uh, all righty. So I think we're ready to move on to our next session, which will be um, Claire talking about the benefits of a good LinkedIn profile. Claire, are you okay to take it away? Yeah. Okay. Um, this is quite amusing in, in some ways, um, because actually my LinkedIn profile is not very good. All the information and advice I had, I haven't taken because I'm, you know, I was too busy doing other things and not, um, you know, thinking about what I could do here. So uh, this is uh, my approach in this to use mine and also have a look at a couple of others just to compare. So LinkedIn, 
Uh, you can see there uh, social networking for work, how exciting, but a little bit of background. Um, while people, uh, if you're already linked in, if you were just write a Y for yes and N for no in the chat box, if you're already in LinkedIn. And while you do that, a little bit of background started in 2003 on, it's available on websites, um, mobile apps. Uh, it's all about business and employment. Uh, and it's also available in multiple languages, supposedly 700 million plus members, but it is now a wholly owned subsidiary of Microsoft. Now they've got 15,000 plus employees. So, you know, just what does that make you think? What are they all doing? In fact, um, they get their revenue through selling your data, um, which sounds very scary, but um, it's data that's going to recruiters and sales professionals. So, you know, of course, it's all about work. It's, it's just like a jobs board in a way. Uh, however, there are lots of uh, links. For example, this one here, um, I can put them in the slide or in the chat box at the end. You don't have to copy them down. But, you know, how does... Um, set up your account preferences, things about signing in and security, um, et cetera, that you can see there. Um, and also you can manage your um, notifications, the types of notifications that you get, the frequency that you get. Um, we all know, you know, we spend half our lives just going through the inbox and uh, deleting stuff or unsubscribing. So it's worth considering um, managing that, but also perhaps consider having a different email address to your own personal one. Don't use your work one because um, as happened to me, I had LinkedIn um, years ago with a work email address and then, um, cause I hadn't used it, uh, forgot the password, but also then because I wasn't using that email address anymore, I couldn't get back into it. And strangely enough, I, I ended up coming back full circle to the same organization and uh, picked up on my LinkedIn that way. So what I wanted to look at here was just thinking about these things here, you can see. Um, as some advice based on what I've read, um, talking to different people. If you want, you know, notes, screenshots, whatever. Uh, I don't think we'll get into breakout rooms for this, but, um, you know, keep in mind using the chat box, um, questions, comments, suggestions, whatever and we'll pick them up at the end in the Q&A. So for anyone who's already in it, um, if you want to write in the chat box or unmute yourselves, you know, how do you use it? For those who used to use it, should be, why did you stop? And for those who aren't in it yet, any impressions that you have of what it is? So I can see lots of people had written yes, some very recently, a couple of no's to whether or not people already used it. But if you want to think, you know, is there anyone here who used to use it and stopped or others who haven't used it yet? What impressions do you have? So any comments, how you use it? Keep writing. So getting people um, in the chat box now talking about job listings, recording professional activities. Um, using it for networking, finding relevant PD articles and news, uh, a professional space as opposed to Facebook. Yeah, interesting. Checking industry news, my professional groups. Excellent. Okay, so keep writing as you have a look. Uh, if you want to, you could go to your LinkedIn page now. If you haven't joined it already, there's the link there. It's pretty straightforward if you just enter it. Um, I wouldn't necessarily, if you're not in it already, I wouldn't dive in and join up now because there's some things to be thinking about. Um, when we look at it, this is what it looks like. The home there, that's where you get your general feeds, what connections of yours have liked or commented on. And you will increasingly be getting promotions. So that's another thing to check out about um, how you manage your feeds. The network, that's interesting. They're all your friends people you follow who follow you. Um, interesting, responding to invitations. I'm curious what uh, you are saying. I had advice from a couple of people who said, don't just make friends willy nilly with everybody. They, I think it's a good question. Um, when you get an invitation, check out the person's profile, consider how closely connected they are to you or not. Um, yeah, I, my, I was surprised how many people were saying, you know, they, they actively, um, you know, 
sort out more connections just to broaden their reach there. Um, whereas I had been thinking, well, I don't want too many people that I don't know um, that well, even if they say they're connected to something similar, is it worth my while? You can also um, disconnect. The jobs, that's where you can search jobs that are recommended for you. And this is something we'll just uh, spend a little time on. How do you make sure you get the feeds for the appropriate jobs? Messaging, as you can imagine, um, it does include promotions, sponsored feeds, um, notifications, um, you know, suggesting that you um, wish somebody a happy birthday or congratulate them for something or other, um, what people are looking for. The me part, that's an important part. That's your profile. We'll look at that. And the work, that's an interesting um, section there. You can see there's a couple of other options there. A few people have mentioned how useful the learning sites are. Now, as far as I know, unless you have a, um, a work-based one, some people at universities have got a work-based um, LinkedIn account, and so therefore they've got access to these learning things. But if you're not in that position, if you've just got your own personal private account, uh, you'd only get access to that for one month for free. So you might want to um, check out what's on offer. They do make recommendations based on your profile again. So that's that's where the me part's really important so that you see what's going on. A couple of other people are writing about, um, let's see, just going back for the people who might not be able to see this. Uh, yeah, connections, comments on... Can, posts made by your connections, um, seeing new trends, what people are talking about. Um, there's more need now. Uh, don't want to keep track of another thing, but need to bite the bullet. Finding industry information, definitely. Okay, following schools, universities, organisations to stay up with. Yeah, great idea to get a colleague to give some tips and ask questions, you know, so bounce ideas around with each other. And Sophie's saying there's a setting not many people know that allows you to convey that you're open to job opportunities. Um, some people have put in their profile that they're, you know, unemployed, um, but it's, um, you know, something to consider how you phrase it, that you're, um, you know, open to opportunities and being able to offer mentoring too. That's interesting. Okay, so if we have a look, um, the first decision, if you haven't already signed up, is doing that but thinking what do you want to get out of it? These were some of the things that I thought were the most relevant, um, apart from, you know, putting it out there with your profile, the way you describe yourself, potentially getting a job because you'll get the feeds or somebody else in your connections sees you and thinks, uh-huh, this is somebody I need to talk to. But um, going for jobs, you can check out profiles of um, people from those organisations or the organisation themselves. Um, Ian Pratt said uh, he always checks out people's profiles on LinkedIn uh, when he's interviewing for jobs. Um, Heno was saying, you know, it's a good chance to amplify your professional voice, develop those relationships. Lots of people use it for PD. And there are some specific groups within it that you might want to join. Um, people do use it um, still for, you know, working with, you know, promoting their business, connecting with consumers. I was a bit surprised that anyone still says B2C and B2B, but apparently they do. Now, your profile is the big thing to think about. Um, there's some basic data there you can see, as you can expect. And this is where there, there are gaps in mine. So when you look at mine, mine's pretty pathetic, really. Um, the photo is another big decision. Generally speaking, they say have a headshot. So just have a look. Here's Brett's and mine. Anything different? Just have a look. No, I can't see any difference between you and Brett Clare. <laughs> yes, I'm going to start impersonating him. <laughs> Have a look, that um, second there, that means that uh, he's a connection of a connection of mine. So in terms of posts, you only see the posts from um, people who are your direct connections and people who are connected to people you're connected with, if you can imagine. That more button there that you can see with him. Ooh, sorry, just go back, I'm trying to move heads out of the way. Um, you know, you could follow him, you can report and block him if you wish. But here's another one. And this is where uh, it's not just the photo, the background, which you can change. You can see she's a first connection of mine. Um, but looking at the headline, 
what you do, what you are, what you're looking for. This is one of the first things obviously people see. It is, um, there is a default and it's based on what you say your job is, but you can edit it with up to 120 characters. They recommend uh, not just your title, but um, you know, mentioning some of your skills there and using particular keywords because then it's easier to find you in searches. So um, making your choice there, if you're going outside of English language teaching, um, generalizing it a bit, but not so general that nobody can find you or you get irrelevant jobs. So just thinking about questions to ask yourself or you know, a buddy when you sit down and work through this, how you would describe yourself, how you recommend others describe themselves. So if you're working with staff, for example, this could be a task in a workshop or as I said, just bouncing ideas around with other people and getting people to um, you know, look at each other's profiles and make suggestions. In terms of Sophie's one, you already know that she's a first connection of mine, but is there anything else that's different there? And Sophie, I didn't have a chance to ask you about this, but the that little brown in, that supposedly indicates you're um, using LinkedIn Premium. Is that correct? Or are you using the free trial for a month, Sophie? Um, I'm using the premium version. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you get a few advantages in that. Um, more messages, but you can actually see not just how many people have looked at your profile, you can see who's looked at it. Mm. Uh, you do get access to those LinkedIn learning courses. Interview preparation, I don't know anything about that, but you can use the one month free trial to access the LinkedIn learning and just go for it, pick out all yep. the cherries there. Mm. And because she's a first connection of mine, you can see there are some other options there um, giving kudos, uh, requesting recommendations. This is something that um, I think we all need to, um, you know, explore recommending the other person um, because that's another thing when people look at your profile and as you can see, if you look at mine, it's, it's pretty drab. Um, I'm surprised anyone um, would read what I uh, have to say because I don't say very much, but um, the lovely Karen Benson did recommend me unrequested. Um, next decision, the summary, you get a chance to write more about your career, the, you know, selling the benefits of connecting with you. And it's here, you have up to 2000 words and some people have gone a bit crazy, but this is where you're thinking about, you know, a brief um, description of your tra trajectory, you know, what choices you've made in your career, where you've gone, achievements, etc. What do you think some of the key features of that are to aim for? when you're writing that summary. You might predict, you know, relatively short. So I think um, this person's probably used all of their characters or words rather, um, keeping it relevant, a little bit of personalization in some way, a flavor of yourself, maybe talking about your motivations and your strengths, but you know, what's the trajectory that someone reading that would see? Where's the logical progression that they can see rather than just, you know, randomness. Uh, and what you're open to, what you're interested in, often, uh, you know, finishing with a question. So consider the spacing here. You might start off with one sentence and then a little paragraph and then finish with a question uh, separate to that paragraph so that people can see quite quickly what you're on about. Um, there might be cultural differences. It may also be related to your position. This person here was a real estate agent in Cape Cod and, um, you know, she's really gone to town on... Um, making it clear that she's uh, connected locally, but I just thought it was possibly more, you know, an American, North American thing to do. But those questions there, thinking how you would summarise your trajectory. So work with others to help you express that and help them edit theirs. Uh, if you like, for time, I may not go there, but um, I was... Um, going to compare mine with my two of my sisters-in-law and you can just see the difference if you have a look uh, at any of those if you want to you can see the difference in how they they're making more use of LinkedIn compared to mine and a suggestion also getting testimonials from people that you work with too uh, and including a value statement great ideas so um, some questions, this came from um, 
a section uh, here about uh, they had some example summaries, including I think that one that I, I showed. But just thinking about what are you going to express there for your summary? You can read those questions. And I think those ones are quite good ones to think about, but also thinking about fields where ELT teaching and uh, management skills come into play and the questions then might change a little bit and how you phrase those considering that people outside of ELT might not know some of the terms that we use. So you need to be clear about that. Um, any other fields that we haven't, sorry, any other, yeah, any other fields of employment that we haven't already mentioned, you might want to write some suggestions in the chat box. And any questions or comments people want to make there? How are we doing for time, Rachel? Yeah, we're absolutely fine for time, Claire, if, you, if you've got more to say. Okay, so there were some tips there about that catchy opening statement, that one line in your summary. Um, Optimised search terms, um, just looking at other people's profiles, you know, what are some of the things that they're mentioning that you could be mentioning? Um, that little bit of flavour of yourself, bit of context to your career. Um, bragging, okay, I, I always have a bit of trouble with that and I think I maybe should just get over myself because there are other people out there who are making really good use of um, posting about things that they're doing or people that they work with are doing or that their organisation is doing and that's all part of the picture. It's not just you, but it's, it's peers, colleagues and your organisation. How much you want to use of the character limit, okay, but short paragraphs, maybe bullet points. Um, don't go overboard with special characters and that call to action at the end you know what are you looking for what are you interested in what are you open to that's a good idea you can also um, consider not just using bullet points but when you look at people's not just their summary but the first headline as it's called um, there are um, say there's little diamond shapes that you can put in between each aspect of yourself your job, what you're interested in, rather than just as I've done writing it in lines. You can see mine if you go to it, it's just all a bit drab. So there you go. Um, next decision, you know, what, what skills are you gonna feature? What endorsements can you get recommendations from others? Um, they could be people that you've worked with, um, clients if you're in business, it doesn't have to be your boss. Uh, it doesn't have to be someone that you've actually worked with in the same organization, it could be you know, somebody here. So I think, you know, definitely have a chat to each other about the skills you can highlight, write some of them in the box now if you want, and think about how you'd express, help others to express theirs. Um, who here would you approach for endorsements? Who would you endorse? You know, we can all do each other a big favour, I think. There are more links there. I think um, if you want to explore, you can definitely learn from Svetlana who uses hers and Claire McGee who uses hers as well, you know, Sophie's, etc. other people who are here, have a look and just, you know, pick the cherries out. And there are also, you know, other links for advice. Um, but that question about the fields where our skills come into play, we do have a lot of skills and I think we need to spend some time thinking about it. I had a look at, um, you know, what was out there for say transferable skills. And this was from TEFL.net, fairly basic place, but just looking at this list, you know, compare with what you're thinking, uh, comment, think about what's not there. If you want to write in the chat box or unmute yourselves. So there's the list. Claire, yes, I think one what something that is missing there is research skills, because as a teachers, we have to do a lot of researching and creating. So there is also research skills and designing, you know, designing this. It, I don't know whether it belongs to project planning, but I think it's that researching is really something and counseling, which is yeah. I think that's Trish's um, skill mostly, uh, but I think counseling here is something that we do a lot. Mm. So people are also putting in things like change management, accreditation, cultural competence, 
Um, you know, quality assurance is another one that uh, springs to mind, you know, those kinds of things. So that I think, um, you know, training of any kind, cor non ELT, corporate training, um, somebody else is writing OHS, yeah. Having sat through um, some very boring OHS, uh, you know, compulsory um, workshops, you know, I, I was always, always uh, thinking, God, I, you know, we could all do this in a much more interesting and useful way training, coaching, mentoring staff. But even um, I know of one person who's um, working as a freelance person, working with organisations all over the world and individuals all over the world, people are doing presentations uh, for business or at conferences who need help with their presentation skills. We've spent a lot of time developing our students and our, our colleagues, you know, our employees skills in that area. Client satisfaction is another one, interesting. So thinking outside the box, cross-departmental, public speaking. Uh, the one who wrote cross-departmental, do you want to clarify what you mean there? That was me, Claire. I just mean um, working across different departments within the organisation. So as DOS, you're kind of straddling, you know, management and the teachers and marketing and all of those different departments, which is a, a really important skill. Mm. And I think um, that creativity is not to be ignored. Um, tech skills as well that could be um, deployed. You know, because some people, you'd be surprised what um, people have to endure, for example, in terms of corporate training. Not the, the most exciting. Um, multitasking, yes. <laughs> uh -huh. I should have chosen that picture with the many hats. But... Um, just some other thoughts. Uh, this was from a Twitter chat with Aussie LT. Questions that you could be using with yourself, with your staff, going back to yourself before you, well, when you started in ELT, what you brought with you, um, what you've developed along the way, um, the strategies and skills that you need, just you know, brainstorming that, you'll get the kinds of information, the kinds of ideas that we're getting here. Uh, some examples of those that are used in other teaching contexts or even in another field. Um, in other subjects, disciplines, how would you facilitate this transfer of strategies and skills with your teachers? And again, the, the non-ELT teachers and academics, um, just choosing what's happening with your PD here, developing their skills and strategies, not just, um, you know, building content knowledge, but it's about being employed, being employable and coping with me, uh, coping with being made you know, de-employed. Um, so I'm nearly finished, but I just wanted to say word of mouth and also through LinkedIn, they're kind of very similar. I ended up getting into, as you know, um, teach training with non-ELTs and so many of the things that you do and are capable of, um, you know, they're looking for value for their teachers, um, building up, say, a shared language with the teaching community because... A lot of the uh, lecturers, for example, are not teachers. And so that the ones I started working with, they didn't have the language to talk about teaching. It wasn't prioritised. Um, they weren't measuring the impact of PD that they did. Um, so looking at not duplicating what's available elsewhere, but really um, fine tuning it, looking what's happening um, outside Australian higher ed as well. And you'd be surprised, I get a lot of requests from teachers now saying, can you teach us more or talk to us more, do a webinar on the Ellicos way of teaching. So, you know, it's, it's permeating. And being prepared to work with different disciplines, the, it, the best way into this kind of thing, if you're interested, is really um, to be able to observe classes, lectures, tutorials, whatever, because then you pick up what's going on and you can refer to that. It's the kind of thing that needs to be set up very carefully. But this was a great opportunity for me through word of mouth from somebody who used to work in ELT and then continued in management in other education organisations and um, you know, knew that she needed somebody with this kind of background that we have. So I just I want to say, um, yeah, I think we, we can all learn from each other and uh, I'm going to go back through the chat box and uh, read my own slides and edit my own profile. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claire. 
um, that was super useful. Whistle stop tour through um, LinkedIn there and so many useful links as well to go back and have a look at. So thank you so much. Um, all right, we'll move on to Rufus now. Um, so Rufus James has kindly um, joined us and she's going to be talking about some transferable skills as well and how she moved from the ELT industry to um, the prison sector and how that's uh, how that is for her. So Rufus, are you good to go? Beautiful, thanks so much. All right, thank you, Claire. Thank you for the invitation to join you guys. Um, I really miss the Ellicos industry. Now, um, as Rachel said, I work in a uh, men's high security prison, a natural progression from being an academic manager and a CELT trainer, clearly. Um, so first of all, I don't know everybody, so a little bit about me. Um, I've had a pretty normal um, introduction to ELT, I suppose. I studied drama at university. I um, worked as a chalet girl in the French Alps. I then kind of fell into teaching because I want to carry on traveling. I was a teacher, an academic manager, a CELT trainer. I worked for NIAS. Um, and this is relatively normal, I guess, this kind of uh, job progression. Um, we, somebody mentioned Idleton earlier on. We go from teacher to manager. We go from teacher to senior teacher or to curriculum designer or teacher to examiner. We move through different contexts, through different parts of the industry. But what I found, because I was a freelancer when COVID hit, was that what happens when you actually need to change industry? And I was really nervous. I've always been uh, the kind of person who says yes to every opportunity. I've always had more than one job. So I was probably in a good position for this to happen. Um, and I thought, oh, new skill set. I've just spent 10 years learning all the terminology in Elicos. I'm going to have to learn new terminology. Oh, my God. And it was actually, honestly, not as difficult as I thought. Moving from teacher to correctional officer, really pretty similar. Same stakeholders. There's no difference apart from, you know, the, the murderers and all of that. But we know where they are, so it's all good. We feel safe. Um, so I guess this, um, this part of the webinar that I'm doing is about my particular experience, but trying to reassure you, to help you reassure your teachers that we are so employable. Our skill sets are so transferable. We just need to find the hook so that we can demonstrate this to other people. So 2021. We never thought we'd get here. 2020 was a really difficult year. I don't need to tell you that. Everybody knows. Um, I live in Brisbane. My life hasn't changed that much. I've been incredibly fortunate. I've had um, a lot less hugging. I didn't get to go to Blues Fest last year. The NIAS conference wasn't on. A lot less hugging. Really, my life hasn't changed that much. I've been very fortunate. But in other ways, absolutely everything has changed for me. The community that I was a part of, the mentors that I had, the mentees that I had, the, the relationships, they're still there, but I'm slightly away from that industry now. And it's been really sad, but it's been amazing to find that there are other industries out there with equally incredible people. And it doesn't mean I can't still be a part of Elicos. Um, now, I'm not sure if you can tell, but I'm clearly not Sue Blundell, so I'm not going to go through statistics at all. But even I can read this chart and see that although things may not have changed that much for me, clearly they have changed hugely for a lot of other people. Unemployment rates have skyrocketed, and this is in Australia. We're so fortunate here. My family are in the UK and I talk to them every week and I just see it going from bad to worse. So things are tough here. They're definitely tougher elsewhere. Um, 
However, that doesn't help. When your life has changed beyond recognition, when everything's different, what do you do? When it feels like we're kind of in the apocalypse and we don't know where we're going to go from here, what happens? It's not just our industry. I mean, chefs in hospitality, uh, sport, uh, performing arts, tourism, all of these industries have been mammothly hit. And where do we go? So I mentioned the apocalypse. If I was to say to you, what do you think is going to survive the apocalypse? What do you think? Write in the chat box. Yeah, Svetlana and Rachel, they're the same thing, politicians and cockroaches, you do realise. Zoom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, mental health sectors and social services are increasing, I'm sure. The food industry as well. Uber is going well. Prisons, yep, numbers are not going down, I've got to tell you. Thank you, Claire. I totally agree. And actually, earlier on today, I was chatting with um, Anna from NIAS, and she also has a new um, area that she's working in. So there are a huge amount of very influential, very articulate, very amazing people who I think we could talk to, not just people in other fields who've reinvented themselves, but people who have moved on. Um, so I think we all have heard the tale that apparently cockroaches would survive the apocalypse. I did some research into this because I was going to make this whole hilarious um, comparison between Ellicott teachers and cockroaches, which I wasn't particularly sold on, but I thought I'll try nonetheless. Apparently they won't survive the apocalypse. It's kind of apocryphal. All of the AP words coming out now, it's quite weird. Um, what I did find out is that these little critters would survive the apocalypse. Has anyone heard of tardigrades before? I hadn't before I started researching this. Now, tardigrades are amazing. They're really fascinating little critters. They are also known as water bears and moss piglets. I think the names are probably cuter than the animals themselves, but that's kind of Doctor Who cute, I think. Um, they are special. They are ancient, tiny organisms. And the thing that is most amazing about the tardigrade is that they can survive the harshest conditions. The scientists have thrown absolutely everything at them. They have frozen them. They have sent them into outer space. They've boiled them alive in unbelievably hot temperatures. They've subjected them to radiation. And because tardigrades are very, very adaptable and flexible and can change to suit the circumstances. Tardigrades can survive for decades in kind of a, ser um, a position of suspended animation. And then they'll come back when conditions are less harsh. And I suggest that Elikos is facing extremely harsh conditions. And so what we need to do maybe is not going to suspend down animation. I think that would be a mistake. But what we do need to do is to be able to adapt, to be really flexible and to wait it out. Things will get better. It will be difficult and it may be a long journey. But if we just take some time to think about how we can uh, diversify and transfer our skills, if, even if we have to leave the industry, we can always come back. And if we have to stay in the industry and change what we do, then that's good too. Does anyone want to try and unmute and pronounce this word? <laughs> Oh, 
I'll be brave. Metaphobia. Yeah, I'm, I'm, my IPA may be a little bit dodgy. I'm not sure about that. Metathesilophobia, something like that anyway. Does anyone know what this is? So this is a fear of change. Like a, it's a phobia. So it's a deep abiding anxiety. It's not just, oh, my bus route's changed. I'm feeling a little bit dodgy about it. It's, it's a real phobia um, of new or different situations of things or people changing. Now, I think all of us have a little bit of this to some extent. And probably at the moment, we also have a little bit of this. And everybody is hoping that the next change that's coming is positive. And I hope so too. But it could be like this wave. It could be that 2020 was bad. <gasps> 2021 says, hold my beer. We just don't know. So we are the only people who can take control of ourselves as much as possible and prepare for what's coming next. Now, <clears throat> Claire mentioned in one of her slides, all of the things um, that we did before we became Ellicost teachers or before we came into the ESL industry. And what did we bring to it? What made us a successful manager or teacher or student services staff, whatever our position was? I think if we're moving across or away from the Ellicost industry, we need to do exactly the same thing. So what I did when I was preparing my CV uh, to apply for a job in correctional services was I looked at all of the skills that I had that were not job specific, they weren't Ellicost specific. And I thought, how can I demonstrate those? And um, as was mentioned earlier, explain them in ways that a non Ellicost layman can understand, which is not easy. I think we have more acronyms in Ellicost than any other industry in the world. And we use them naturally because we've spent so much time learning them. I think that's what it is. Um, so um, I looked at my skills and I thought, what skills do I have that are transferable? And when I started looking at my skills, I was quite stumped because if you've ever been to a job interview and somebody says, what are you good at? That's a difficult question to answer. It's much more confronting really to brag, as Claire said, we're not really used to saying, I'm great at this, I'm good at this, you should hire me for this reason. So I looked at my skills and I thought, what can I do? I can always choose the slowest queue at checkout in a supermarket. Definitely, that's a skill. Uh, what else can I do? I can unerringly identify the person in my organization who wants to go for a beer after work. Excellent skill, Claire, I'm looking at you. But these weren't really things that I thought would help me in the prison service. So then I thought about soft skills. And there are so many things that if I was in competition as an Ellicost professional with a chef, a... Um, somebody who works in a hotel, somebody who is a sports star, somebody from the performing arts. I thought I'm actually pretty competitive. I'm, I have emotional intelligence. I can manage people. I can work with a range of stakeholders. Um, I'm empathetic. I'm good at listening. I can elicit from people. In fact, I probably elicit a little bit too much and it's a little weird for my new colleagues. But all of these things that we take for granted in Ellicos when we come to the table in competition with everybody else who's in that graph that we saw earlier with the rise in unemployment, we're so competitive, we're so employable. So I did some research too. I went to different places than Claire. Um, what I did was I had a look uh, online. I went to Forbes, I went to Harvard Business Review and various places like this and looked at the skills that they thought would be necessary when people were trying to reinvent themselves in a post-COVID world when everyone is out there looking for a new position or a new industry, a new place to call home. These are the things that I found that they had in common. And the same as a lot on Claire's list, I think if you look at these, 
our teachers, especially recently, have displayed these in spades. Maybe tech savviness before everyone was forced to go online wasn't something that we would congratulate all of our teachers on. But the ability of people to pick up Zoom and Moodle and Google Classrooms and a range of online tools and run with them, for me, has been amazing to see, really inspirational. The other ones as well, I can't think of a single teacher who I would employ who doesn't possess these skills. So I went through my CV and I thought of practical examples so that I could give an example, not just say, yes, I can do these things for all of these skills. Um, what I'll do when I send a PDF of my presentation is I'll include some examples that I thought of so that it can give you something to maybe springboard off. Um, but yeah, and all of these things, when I first moved into the prison, you can imagine it's pretty, it's a pretty different context to the comfort zone of Ellicos. You know, even when I was a NIAS quality assurance assessor and I would go to new um, colleges, new universities, high schools, and it was a new context, I was familiar with the environment. I was familiar with the language. I was familiar with the people and the way we communicate. Now, every day I put on a uniform with epaulettes. It's fabulous. I have a massive bunch of keys that dangle at my waist. I have heavy metal doors that I lean against. I wear blue. The prisoners wear green. It is such a confronting and different situation. And a lot of people come into this situation working in a prison and it's too much. But I think because of the skills that I have from my Ellicos time, it's not been too difficult. My colleagues have all been really shocked with how easily I fitted in and made relationships with prisoners, with prison guards, with the people, the difficult characters that nobody can work with. And I think that's what we have as Ellicos professionals. We have these transferable skills that are all based on humans. It's not based on our knowledge. It's not based on our amount of time, maybe. It's based on who we are as a people and that relationship building, that empathetic, um, humanistic view that we have in the world. So it's absolutely possible and not that difficult if you say yes to every opportunity and you are genuine. You are who you are. You can't try to be somebody different. I guess that would be my my best advice. Um, so uh, I've got my email address on the next slide. Happy for you to contact me. Um, it's very appropriate that we're talking today because the last thing I wanted to say is there is one great example out there of somebody who has moved from one industry to another and is oh, unfortunately quite unstoppable. So if we look at the ex-president of the United States, we can see that he has seamlessly and surprisingly moved from reality to the White House. Next, who knows, maybe a laborer's job at Four Seasons Total Landscaping. I don't know. We can only hope. But if he can do it, we can do it too. <laughs> so thank you very much for putting up with my ridiculousness. and. Um, if anyone has any questions later, I'm happy to answer. Thank you so much, Rufus. That was wonderful and just so nice to have some humour. And I, yeah, we love the tardigrades. They're fabulous. That should be a, <laughs> a metaphor for us all. <laughs> um, there'll be a chance for some Q&A at the end, but we'll um, pass on now to Svetlana, uh, Svetlana, who's going to give us some... Are you okay, Svetlana, to do that now or...? Yeah? Uh, some information about just some PD and training that we could do ourselves or also pass on to our teachers um, if they're thinking about staying in the um, education industry. Okay, let me try to share. Um, look, it's very difficult to follow those two 
beautiful things that you've done, especially Rufus's humor and thing. But I was thinking about maybe on the three stressful moments in life, because one of my friends who is a psychologist said, getting married, relocating to another country, and of course that in the family are three most stressful uh, situations in your life and make you very stressful. I think Ellicott's changes and plummeting numbers are probably to add to that one. So I, I wasn't, I, my presentation is going to be a little bit more about, oh, I'm using the PDF, that's okay. Um, I'll, I'll probably stop sharing and change my. So um, Sophie may share these with you. Um, so then you can see that. I thought it's forward to online future. I believe that we, our future would be better at some stage. Um, I'm optimist, but sometimes today I wasn't, and Libby is here present, so she can share that. But I think finding out what you like doing best and get someone to pay you for that doing, I think it's the best advice I could give with this professional development. Um, I have been looking through these and I found so many opportunities. Of course, some of them are free, some of them are costly, some close to home, some very far. And um, I looked into various things like uh, starting from LinkedIn and I have to say that I use LinkedIn a lot, although I have a work um, account, but I also use my premium account. So that's why maybe I have all those other things that Claire mentioned. Um, but I found that LinkedIn, Lear Link LinkedIn Learning, uh, previous Linda Learning, you can look at millions of different videos and maybe you can find your next profession if you decide to go there. Uh, but this is my choice and it probably reflects some of my preferences, what I would like to do because it's difficult to know what other people would like to do. <clears throat> I thought if you want to stay in teaching, maybe you want to refresh your giving feedback. There is a short videos and courses. They are, and each of these links have a, actually um, HTTP, so you can, when you click on that, you can go to, directly to that one. Um, interesting for me was the key mental shifts for servant leaderships, because we always lead somebody, and I think leading is some, some of the skills, transferable skills that we can, soft skills that Rufus was talking about. Um, if you decide to stay in education, learning Microsoft Teams for education is very important because you can, many companies uh, do use Microsoft Teams and that's, there is a spelling mistake. Good, I noticed that because the slides do not have it. Um, then there is um, something that uh, Future Learn has and it's interesting that Australian universities have about 35 courses offered at Future Learn. Most of the courses at Future Learn are free but some of them are part of a fast track and you paid about $59 for month subscription. And some of these uh, courses can take you to degrees and they are useful. So you start from things like Monash University, transitioning from a friend to a leader. I thought that was very interesting because being a colleague, you very often become friend, but how do you become a leader? Uh, then uh, there is psychology of learning by University of Southern Queensland or six, eight weeks course of the, about neuroscience, which was very interesting for me. Um, so all these short courses, many of the eight, uh, of our eight universities, big universities have courses, uh, micro-credentials. But what I found very interesting was this designing for learning, designing the course to be user-friendly in the online environment, that's UTS one. This one is not free, of course and it's about $1,200. So if you go there, you would find that that's, um, and it's an interesting, I don't think it's a very uh, techy. I think it's useful to learn how to design course to be online course. One of my teachers has done um, some certificate when, it, when COVID hit and she did that with Charles Stewart University, but now she's planning to do TAFE and to do a certificate in education, to be assistant in a primary, I think mostly primary school, uh, because that's a way to get into public schools and private schools without, because sometimes our qualifications are not recognized. So she told me about that. It's for mature age workers over 35. I thought, mm, that's interesting, over 35. Uh, you need to prove that you are not working at the moment, that you are probably stood down, not really. Uh, but there are some certificates that could be useful. 
and there was a huge discussion at OZLT discussion board. Um, so if you are a member of it, you can find it under the discussion people saying what you need to do with training, uh, certificate of training and assessment. Now, the next thing, I'm a teacher in my heart and I don't think I will never stop being teacher. So I always look at the continuous professional development and teaching courses and coming from Europe and being very much connected to British Council in my previous life, which was again to do with teaching. Um, I liked what British Council does. Um, and they have this how to plan and teach great English lessons, 12 weeks of the course. And it's very interesting because they talk about progression and the th third course being one that um, is very much about reflection. And I think that's where our skills will be very useful to reflect in what we have done. Open University has a lot of TESOL courses, but also in education sector, training and teaching, uh, they have about 44 degrees and 203 subjects, a lot of things to choose. And then you can make some choices like uh, bespoken courses like University of New England does those as well. Um, NIAS has been doing a lot of professional development and online courses and recognizing uh, quali quali uh, endorsed DLT qualification providers like Griffin and Monash and Macquarie. But uh, I think our brain is playing a lot of tricks these days with us. So I always looked at neuroscience and this eight week neuroscience thing, it was very interesting for me. Thank you, Central Queensland University for creating this one. And of course, good one, English Swift. If, if you have somebody who doesn't have the certificate, graduate certificate or masters in teaching English to speakers of other, maybe that's the time to take the course. Although our government decides that humanity and arts should be paid more. Power up programs are something that is done in a, a contribution that this is a collaboration with Macmillan and um, Nile. The, when we talk Nile, I suppose you might know that it's a, a specialist teacher development institute in Norwich where many of famous people who write our books work um, and they do also master uh, master program as well. So the next thing that I was looking at, these are very expensive and yes there is one ACU course here but it's not that I want to promote Australian Catholic University but I just thought that master of education and education leadership online that has been so often popping on in LinkedIn, in my Instagram. And I just went to see what, and it was interesting, Sophie, you inspired me, I saw you liking it. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to go and check this one. It's a very interesting program. It's a Deakin University, but other universities have it as well as University of Newcastle um, and ACU has it. These courses are unfortunately very expensive. Unless you get a study assist, or um, if they have any commerce support places, or you have a stack of money hidden somewhere before COVID, you might try to do those. But they are, I think these are the skills that, you know, if you want to stay with one leg, one foot, sorry, not like one foot in this industry, and then you think about leadership, are these the absolutely transferable skills and knowledge. And I really like Nile uh, master program. I know it's very expensive, but I thought, oh, I can at least uh, dream. Um, it has a very interesting one core module, um, two electives and a list of electives is great. And, um, but no possibility probably for financial support. And it costs about, I think it's about 7,000. I, 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 I did write it somewhere about almost 7,000, 9,000 9, pounds or 7,000 pounds. Hello, British help me. That's very, it's not cheap at all. Uh, but very, very interesting if you want to stay in that one. Um, of course, we are not traveling anywhere and that it's very difficult for me, particularly. Um, I would like to go back to see my family, um, extended family in Europe, but there are conferences and all of them are online, virtual conferences. Of course, Sophie will tell us soon when in English Australia is. But there is one uh, coming soon on in April in England. It's English Teaching Conference, and we have ITEFL in June, all virtual one. But I decided to choose a couple of that we usually don't talk about, which is a foreign English language teaching conference in Berlin, just beginning of a month registration going on. 
then Bellop conference exploring pedagogical approaches in EAP. My, I like the EAP English for academic purposes. And uh, then there is a lot of conferences coming in the Southeast Asia that are online in Singapore and Korea. Uh, then there is a TESOL convention in the US. There is one in, um, this one is in uh, Hong Kong, the International Conference on Language Teaching and Learning. Uh, this one is in Canada. I don't know whether you would like to go to Brock University, but a very interesting program uh, and education research coming one in Oxford. And I picked up being patriotic here, uh, but the Serbian conference in Belgrade is actually very good and they always have a good speakers because London is not far away. And they have a regional um, American culture center and British council work very thoroughly. So it, it can be very, very useful. I love this one, yeah, the re-envisioning re ELT Zoom Discord Padlet in February in Korea. So at the end, I just listed some links with the, of course, English Australia events that we all know, um, or Oxford University Press Professional Development Webinars free. Um, this is an interesting website. They have a list of calendars of ELT events, and it was interesting. I would like to research more what, where they get them, but the list is long. ITF events, one coming in March uh, from um, and the managers SIG. And then the Teaching and Education Research Association has a lot of events and uh, TERA events. So that's what TERA events stand for. Um, Oxford Teachers Club, if you want to refresh your knowledge of different sources and how to use them. Cambridge Assessment International Education has a millions of different webinars and they are not all, all about ELT, as well as Macmillan together will now. So that's my choice of, and that means I would like you all to stay in this industry if possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Svetlana. There's so much information there that you've put together. Um, we will share those um, slides with everybody as well, so you can have a, have a good look and, and share them with your colleagues, um, your, your teachers as well, I think would be really useful. And some great chats happening in the chat box there. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the reasons that we put this um, session together today was that I was thinking with the committee that, you know, we, it would be great to give our teachers some information, some advice. Um, about what what they can do with their skills, not only our, our skills and transferring, but what what our teachers can can move on to if they're looking for something else. Um, all right, so just uh, does anyone have any Q&A for the some questions for any of our presenters today? Claire. Rufus, I'd love to hear more about how you got this job. I'm curious, A, where you saw the position being advertised? Um, what you know, working in corrective services, I'm imagining therefore it's not like the public service where say going for a public service job from outside is quite difficult. And sometimes there are um, requirements that you, you have to demonstrate in your application that you've met, you know, that can be quite onerous. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? And um, what do you actually do in the prison apart from jangling your keys? Yeah, not much. Jangling the keys is basically the job description. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not a good example of how to get <clears throat> jobs in a, in a normal way, I guess. I also own a cafe for any of you who've come to a conference that I've spoken at. I usually try to bribe the people who attend with brownies from my cafe. And um, great brownies. They are great brownies. It's so true. And they're, yeah. Uh, one of our customers was a manager at the prison. And he came in one day and he said, oh, you're uh, here a lot more now. And I said, oh, yeah, I've just finished teaching CELTA and there isn't one for a while and there's no international students coming in. So I'm a bit worried. And he kind of went, oh, OK, went away, came back the next day and said, there's an education job going at the prison. I think you'd be really good. Would you like to meet your colleagues? I mean, potential colleagues. So it was not uh, that I was looking for it. It kind of, it came to me. Um, I do know that corrective services um, don't tend to post 
on Seek, they have a particular place where they post these kind of positions, which I can find and pop on the um, PowerPoint when I send it uh, to Rachel and Sophie. Um, yeah, so it the way I got the job would not be the typical way that you get the job. They, As far as I can see, they do tend to often recruit from within. So if people are at other correctional centers and there's a job opening, they will um, put out an expression of interest. Um, and th that seems to be, apart from my case, how most jobs are filled. And so are you working with the prisoners, helping them develop their language or communication or other skills? Yeah, um, it's, it's interesting because my manager is fantastic. He's um, not a micromanager. He trusts his staff. And so he lets us kind of write our own, um, <laughs> um, our own uh, projects in some ways. So we have um, classes that are certainly at the moment with COVID restrictions, they're run by peer tutors who are other prisoners with maybe no teaching experience but they may have gone through year 10 or TPP, which is the tertiary preparation program or university studies. And they are willing and able to help their, um, their peers. Uh, sometimes we have facilitators coming in. So that's a really interesting job. If you work for certain RTOs, they will send in facilitators to teach um, functional literacy and numeracy. Um, so that's a really interesting way to work with this very different cohort of students. We don't tend to teach the prisoners um, ourselves. It's more facilitating with the universities and the RTOs. Um, however, um, I came straight from a CELT course and I really miss my teacher training and the peer tutors I could see. There's all this differentiation in the classroom. Mm -hmm. There's people from no literacy to ESL students, to university students, 20 years old, 80 years old in the same class. I've never seen such diversity and people doing such a good job with no experience and no teaching techniques doing so well, but clearly very stressed. So I've written um, a teach training program for incarcerated peer tutors. So that's what I do every week. Um, we have a teach training session and then they plan their classes for the next week it's been amazing yeah but I'm very fortunate I don't think that's possible in every context but I think you make of each job what you can if if I was to go in and just do what I was told to do do what my job description is it would be very different I've kind of written my own own job description with the support of my manager because I said I'm bringing these skills can I use them? And it, it will benefit my co-workers. It will benefit the other people I work with. It will benefit the prisoners. And fortunately, he said yes. And um, it's been really, really interesting. Sounds amazing. Mm. Thank you. Yes, Linda. Did you have a question? Oh, I'm sorry. I was just clapping. I'm sorry. Oh, is, that a, is, that hands, a, sorry. is that a hand? I'm sorry. No worries. Anyone else got any uh, questions or comments? Here's a clap. <laughs> I think uh, one of the things that we need to think of is it's, it's a lot of us. I don't know. I, I, I have been reading again about introverts and extroverts. And I think it's something that we, we in our profession meet very often. And I think it's something that we might be working on those skills you know if we are in we are probably all extroverts in our classrooms and because that's where we command command inverted commas but that's where we are but sometimes for our teachers is getting out into the world and doing something else can be pretty dramatic and i i just i'm my, a couple of teachers came across my mind because i was thinking about it so they are so used to this cause the atmosphere that we have in our Alico staff rooms and suddenly the big bad world, wolf outside of the business world can be very, very, I don't know, scary for them. 
To add to um, the courses that Alana was talking about, I don't know if everyone's aware, but TAFE are doing a lot of free courses at the moment yes. for people who have been stood down, made redundant. Um, so there are a lot of free of things on there um, that are that could be really useful, including the uh, Cert Foreign Training and Assessment I saw is on there. Yeah. And this certificate in education, it's a, uh, it's a certificate for in literacy, and that makes you body, so you can be assistant teaching assistant at school, and you take just a couple of this. So that's that's what my teacher is planning. So that I just wrote her a letter that she so she be eligible for, um, because that's then free. And then can take to certain degrees. So there are others. I must say that the training and assessment government website is pretty daunting. When you look at that, I was like, oh, I don't want to look at that. You do have a link, but I think if you go even for tape, uh, sometimes you go in the circles. So word of mouth, sometimes finding out what you can do is probably the best thing to do. Ah, looking a job trainer. Yeah. What's job trainer? Job trainer is um, where I found the information about the TAE being offered by TAFE um, and other providers. So, because I, I found the same looking on a government website or TAFE, I got lost and yeah. kind of stumbled my way out three days later looking disheveled. Um, but I found if you go to job trainer, yeah. And it will have different industries and you can actually find whether it's a free course or a subsidized course and in which uh, state it's offered and um, whether it's offered for free or whether you have to pay. For example, Queensland, the TAE is $50, but it's free in New South Wales. Yes. That's it. Not free in Victoria. Yeah, I know. A tricky one. But still, that's a heck of a lot cheaper for, um, you know, from um, other PAEs. But when the COVID hit, um, because a lot of universities were offering courses that were otherwise would be like, I think, 16, 16Ks or something, they were doing that for cheap. So those certificates, you know, particularly for digital learning and online learning, they were. and. Um, I was checking at some of them, so there's some of them have already those, but I think a couple of them still don't have their courses for 2021, but my colleague told me that they, if you search a little bit more, actually you can find them and they might be offering again some scholarships because that's obviously where many universities will go, particularly universities who are regional, they do that. Sophie, I think we are, any, anything you and Rachel want to? Has anyone got any more questions or comments or are we probably good to wrap up at that point? Um, I know that was a bit of a whistle stop tour and we just, we just tried to hit quite a few things there in an hour and a half, but hopefully it was a bit of food for thought and yeah, a stepping stone to have a conversation with your staff or your you know mentors, friends with about their next steps or your next steps. And we will be sharing everything from um, today. And yeah, thank you so much for the presenters. It's been so, so nice hearing some different stories. Um, and yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll keep you in touch with any everything else that's coming up with AMSIG. Yeah, and thank you thank for you. all the today as well, Rachel.